What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLP FM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archive at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today, we are talking about uh, women artists' creativity and self-destruction. We have Sabrina Chapajev on the line from San Francisco. She's the editor of the new Seven Stories Press anthology, Live Through This on Creativity and Self-Destruction. This is an anthology of a number of very prominent um, women artists, um, poets, um, performance artists, uh, filmmakers, um, sex radicals, people from the counterculture, queer movement. I'm really, really impressed by this. It was a really um, great uh, read, and I encourage people to uh, really check it out. It's called Live Through This on Creativity and Self-Destruction, um, Seven Stories Press. Check it out in your local, um, your local independent bookstore. And thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio, Sabrina. Hello, Will. How's it going? Good. Yeah. Congratulations on the book. It's it's just um, it's so moving. These stories are so powerful. People talking about really intimate topics that that just don't get um, addressed like this um, anywhere in our culture. Eating disorders, cutting, suicide, risky sex, drug use, all the different sort of destructive parts, things that we think of as self-destruction. But I think with the book talks about and what's wrote so inspiring and interesting is how it's completely part of people's creativity. So tell us more about the book and who's in it and what it what it talks about. Um, well, so yeah, let's do this on creativity and self-destruction. It's uh, my sort of standard pattern is, you know, it's a book about women who use art to deal with self-destructive tendencies. Um, but it sort of afterwards became a bit of a relationship in the, you know, self-destruction and creativity, how those two uh, forces play off each other. And... Um, Basically, I mean, I'll tell you sort of like a long story of it since we have an hour, uh, which is I first it was it was first supposed to be for smart girls considered suicide. And it was supposed to be, you know, 20 stories of women that were going to commit suicide, but then didn't. And uh, I was like, well, that'll be boring to hear, you know, the same story over and over again. So I decided to expand it um, into self-destruction. And I really tried to focus on finding as many of the sort of necessary stories to get out there as possible of women dealing with self-destruction in different ways. And, I mean, I think it is the first book that talks about female self-destruction in a broad sense instead of, like, there's other ones that are like, this is a cutting book or this is an anorexia book. This is, you know, um, and this is sort of like, no, this is a, a bunch of ways that women are taking away from themselves. Basically, I went to all the women that I really respected um, and that I thought were pretty amazing, cutting-edge thinkers, and I asked them if they had a story um, of how they turned their rage to the page or how they took that destructive energy and converted it towards something creative and hoped that they... uh, It was weird because I wanted people to tell their stories, but I didn't know who had a story, so part of it was even finding um, who would who would talk. A lot of these are artists who are known for their work, but maybe haven't really revealed this side of themselves before in, in writing. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was a very big thing, is that I sort of didn't want to go to people that are known for this. But, you know, I also didn't want people to be sort of only known for their, for their self-destructive habit. I wanted six, people that were successful in separate careers that you wouldn't expect to have these things to talk openly about it so that women currently dealing with these things or anyone currently dealing with these things would be like, oh, my gosh, she had a problem? How could that be? She's so powerful today. And it it was a very important thing to find people that were really successful, that people really looked up to, and still have them basically open up about, for many of them, which is, you know, the most painful experience and raw um, part of their lives. It was it was sort of hard to do. <laughs> yeah, tell us some of the um some of the people who are in the in the book. You've got Bell Hooks, um Kate Bornstein, P- Patricia Smith, a lot of really um well-known artists. 
I, 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 I had this sort of checklist of three columns. Um, one was sort of like, it, 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 it was an awful thing for anyone to really see. But um, the three columns, one of them was artistic medium, because I wanted to show writers, dancers, photographers. I wanted to show all different types of art. Um, the second column was uh, type of self-destructive tendency, because I didn't want to have like 20 stories by alcoholics and nothing touching cutting or, you know, depression. And then the third column was uh, sort of diversity um, in terms of mostly ethnic diversity, because when I first had the 10 women, uh, all of them were white. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is not good, you know. So I really, it was hard. I had to pass up some stories that I thought were really good at the, towards the end of finding contributors because I was so focused on finding women that weren't white to tell their stories. So tell us a little bit more about the, the contributors. And uh, people probably recognize um, Bell Hooks. Kate Bornstein has been on the, on the show before. Yeah. Um, and, and what were some of the things that they, that they wrote about? Uh, Bell Hooks, that was sort of a magical one that just sort of, she, um, she agreed very quickly and turned in her essay. She was actually the easiest writer in the world to work with. And she wrote about, her, her essay is called no More, no More Crying. And it's all about how when she was young and in a, like, in a southern, very sort of like, you know, um, a more religious type of household, uh, she had seven brothers and sisters and it was a bit of an abusive uh, environment. And she would often just cry out sort of in the face of the abuse and just didn't even know what she was crying, but had the feeling that her family was stuck in um, sort of the road of history. And she couldn't even really enunciate what was going on. It, but the only thing she could do was sort of cry out and say, something's wrong, this is not right. And uh, her entire essay is sort of about, you know, how her parents or other people would say, you know, strong black female women do not cry. And uh, you're going to be crazy if you cry. But because she was able to um, read and identify with characters in other books, uh, such as Jane Eyre and, like, I think it was Wuthering Heights, she was able to see how children were often the unjust target for adult rage. And she was like, wait a second. In these books, these kids are totally, you know, they're being blamed, but it's not their fault. The fault lies b behind that. So in understanding that was pop possibly what was going on in her life, she was able to extract herself from the, sort of violent situation and look at it more um, like and know that the problem wasn't her. I think that's a big thing that goes on with the book. At one at one point or another, someone realizes that the problem is not just them, but sometimes uh, is something that society has placed upon us. Um, so yeah, Bells, Bells is called No More Crying and it's it's just about how she was able to stop finally crying out and begin to um, sort of to speak about what was going on instead of that sort of painful wail. Yeah, that's really remarkable because, you know, Bell Hooks is, you know, known internationally for her very, very powerful, very strong um, feminist, anti-racist um, theory, looking at the class system, challenging white supremacy, and just to have her vulnerable side and to have her talking about her childhood and how she struggled with that in a way is, is a really amazing glimpse into her as, as a, as a writer and as a theorist. Yeah. I mean, that, that's like one of the, that was one of the coolest things, like realizing, wait, Bell Hooks wanted to kill herself when she was little. Really? Really? Because the thing is we see all these really amazing, intelligent women at their end points when they've gone through all these things. And when you're currently dealing with something, you just feel weak in the face of their successes sometimes, you know, you're like, wow, they can just do that so easy. But you never really get to know what it took for them to get there. And the fact that, you know, Belle was able to open up about that and all these other women um, were allowed for more of a an understanding of the process of an artistic life as opposed to the final product of it. Did you approach um, art artists and ask them to, to write about their self-destructive side and then have any of them say, oh, no, 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 I don't have any self-destructiveness at all? Because I think, I mean, I guess my point is that the, that something like suicide or 
um, you know, drug use or people doing risky sex and different ways that we're, we harm ourselves or risk harming ourselves is actually really much more common than I think people realize, especially among, among creative people, sensitive people. Well, it was really strange because there were some people who I knew specifically had sort of self-destructive tendencies that were like, no, I don't. And I couldn't tell if they just didn't want to do the anthology. Um, and there were, because uh, I, I did pinpoint a lot of uh, specific people and ask them, like, point blank, please write for this. But I also sent, sent calls for submissions out, and especially on different websites, you know, like an Asian American website. You know, I was really, when I was really trying to get it to be more of a cultural thing. Um, and I was getting these emails about, from people proposing the piece they would like to write. And a lot of them, their self-destructive tendency was not what we would consider self-destructive usually at all. One woman was like, you know, I would write about how I stayed in a marriage for 10 years I didn't want to be in. You know, uh, someone else was like, how I fell in love with my college roommate but didn't tell her. And so these finer, different points, people, any act can be self-destructive. And that was something that I talked about a bit in the intro is that it's simply when a woman takes away from her own power and there are more understood ways of this in terms of like you know the cutting type thing or you know um you know being really hungry and not not taking care of yourself but if you restrict yourself in any way and that way becomes an addiction that is also self-destructive so it, it was a sort of hairy to to understand what pieces should be in the book and which one shouldn't that's yeah, that's really interesting because i think we all do we all do experience self-destruction on some level but the, it's a question of extremes and degrees and the um, stories that you put together are really they're really harrowing i mean it's really extreme there's a lot of violence in the book and a lot of really kind of scary struggles that people have have gone through and do you think that the ex the extremes that that these women have gone through is really related to their genius and their brilliance i mean they all are, are ex excelling at what they do and do you think that there's a direct connection between that the extremity of of their the self-destructiveness and the kind of genius and brilliance that they have as artists um that's that's a really hard question to answer because it's a dangerous question to answer but for the most part, I mean, if I was, I've spoke about this sort of in other interviews, and the fact that, you know, self-destructive women or artists get more face time than ones that are totally healthy and functioning and equally as brilliant. You know, um, if I had, um, it's funny because I was like, I should make a long list of women artists that are not self-destructive. So I can sort of refer back to it, but like if if I was let's let's try and think of one, um, if if I was going to have a book that had half women that had dealt with self destruction and half that hadn't, um, the brilliance of the women that hadn't would be revealed in other ways. Women are brilliant, you know, and men are brilliant, but like anyone that achieves uh, a new way of um, expressing themselves. Uh, just really puts forth their soul in 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 an external way, be it dance, be it singing. Um, you know, th that's a, a brilliant person. People have different ways of getting there. I I, I was never one, any one for the for the Brontes, the Jane Eyre's. I never read any of that stuff, even though I wanted to. But there was one of one of them just sat and wrote in um, you know after dinner every night. And that was her writing. Yeah, it's. Im I think. Yeah, I think you're right. It's important not to kind of sensationalize or st or stereotype because um, there's there's the danger of that. Yeah, I mean there's there's the danger of it, but then even more so, that that's an easy easy fix. But I know plenty of people that are very self destructive, that are just not artists at all, or not good artists, and they they make they make what they consider art out of their pain, thinking that just because that shock factor of what they're doing to themselves is enough. But if you do not work on the craft of it, if you do not seriously consider the art that's before you as being something separate from your um, sort of personal art therapy process, 
well, then it's just art therapy, you know? Yeah, because all of these artists, like you say, are, these are very talented, very accomplished, um, very dedicated um, artists who've been working for, for years on their on their craft and um, have gotten inc- incredible recognition and awards for it. So we talked about Bell Hooks. So who are some of the other um, the other contributors to the anthology? Well, you, you mentioned Kate Bornson, which is, uh, she was actually a huge reason. Well, she was the reason I got signed on with Seven Stories. Uh, I was directed to her by Carol Queen, and Kate said yes right away and then said, can I pass along your proposal to Seven Stories? And uh, Kate had just come out with her book, um, Hello, Cruel World, 101 Alternatives to Suicide for Sweet Geeks and Teens. And actually, I, I saw uh, a little, uh, there are two drawings in Hello, Cruel World that she sort of, you know, how she has so many uh, pictures in that. There were two drawings uh, that she did when she was uh, living as a Scientologist. Uh, and uh, I, I was fascinated by those drawings because I didn't know that Kate drew. And uh, I asked her, I'm like, do you have any more? And then I got to go through like 80 of them and choose about five or six that I thought were really good for the book, and then uh, interviewed her uh, along with my editor, uh, Crystal. And um, and then we, that Kate's piece was one of the hardest ones to put together. But uh, after interviewing her and then putting those with the pictures, um, it was all about sort of art is spirituality and um, art is religion almost. And it's really interesting that for people who don't know that Kate was involved in the Church of Scientology, it's a really interesting glimpse into that, and it kind of gets into how you know spiritual practice or religious beliefs can also be in some ways an act of self-destruction sometimes. Well, if any time that I mean, any time that any belief um, is going against what you firmly believe yourself, that's self-destructive. So, but it it was really interesting uh, to, and I was very, I really wanted to have religion be a part of it. Um, so I was really happy when that worked out with Kate. Um, but you know, that closeness to God, those eternal questions. You know, she she really wanted to know the big questions, the answers to the big questions, and uh, and she turned to religion uh, to do it, to a slew of religions, and then finally um, to the everyday practice of art. And that is what has sustained her and her wild, brilliant mind. Tell us about the piece by Nicole um, Blackman, because she wrote a fictional um, poem, um, I guess, about eating disorders, um, anorexia, and then it kind of got got a life of its own. It was really interesting to read about that. Yeah. Nicole Blackman, oh my gosh, she writes, uh, she writes the manifestos for the women that don't, don't usually have them. She's, She's just so good. Uh, the poem is called Holy. Um, maybe I'll just read the first few lines of it. Um, Holy, I eat only sleep and air, and everyone thinks I'm dumb, but I'm smart because I've figured it out. I'm slimmer than you are, and I'm burning my skin off little by little until I reach bone and self, until I get to where I am essential, until I get to where I am. Food doesn't tempt me anymore because I am so full of energy and sense I can even pass by water now because I am living off the parts of me that I don't need anymore. I could feel the slow drip of pain before, swirling inside where my lungs should have been. Now I'm clean inside. And then the poem continues on. Um, That's actually on the MySpace, uh, an incredible recording of her reading that poem for the book, which is myspace.com, lived through this 2008. Um, There's an incredible version of her reading that. Uh, The entire poem just is you know, this woman talking about sort of the incredible feeling and sense of power that she gets from, you know, starving herself. And um, it is written from an anorexic viewpoint, but not in a shameful way, which is something that sort of hasn't been done before, you know, is done in a way that is like, isn't this great? You know, the, the real twinkle in the eye. And um, after Nicole published that, she started, it just resonated so hardcore with all of these women. And um, they believed that she was anorexic. And when she said that it was actually a character study, uh, some of them got really, really offended. 
you know, just like, how could, how dare you write about that? And there was this, there was this duality where they had been opening themselves up to her, being like, you understand, you understand. And once she hadn't actually experienced it, they just turned on her. But even more, just kept on sending her letters, fan mail, and she ended up having correspondence with just so many young women that would write to her detailing their self-destruction because they thought she understood. And they'd be like, isn't it great? This is how I how I take away from myself. This is how I kill myself. And they would send her these horrid uh, emails and pictures. And, um, and she sort of had to enter the world of female self-destruction um, because, you know, that poem spoke so much that it just came echoing back to her in, in the loudest way. And uh, finally she sort of ends talking about a specific um, relationship she had with a, a woman named Alice. Um, a, who sort of was the the cocktail of all the different types of self-destructive uh, behaviors and her, and her relationship with her. So um, it's a really interesting um, essay, and even more so Nicole talking about how uh, how she was able to see that the, the pattern of female self-destruction, where sort of male self-destruction often tended to be f u while female self-destruction often to be internalized and was like, you know, ask me. Yeah, the cliche is that sort of men take it out on other people and end up in jail, and women take it out on themselves and end up in mental hospitals. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's a, that was a really, it was very hard. It was like one of the only few times I sort of let male self-destruction sort of creep in for a second because, it was hard. I've gotten a lot of, you know, flack being like, well, don't men self-destruct as well? And I'm like, well, of course they do. And some men self-destruct in the same way that women do, but male self-destruction is a very different thing. Um, but, yeah, that I mean, that is the gist of it that she sort of talked about, is that, yeah, men tend to externalize a bit more and the women internalize, and therein lies the difference. Yeah, and I think the yeah. intimacy of the piece, it's great to have a collection of women um, women artists because the intimacy of it is really going to speak very deeply to women. I mean, I, I found it fascinating as, as a man as well, and there are a lot of commonalities, but having all these women together, there's a commonality of female experience that's expressed through all these different artists that's really, really interesting. One of the things that's, that I think was interesting about the Nicole Blackman um, piece was that um, when she created that that poem that was so popular, it was kind of used as a banner of um, pro-anorexia, um, pro-starvation um, websites and the kind of the, the very um, sort of hidden underground of girls, mostly um, very young uh, teenage girls who are sort of sharing this um, this culture and this mystique that's encouraging and promoting um, their starvation of themselves. So it was a really right. interesting study of how the dangerous territory an artist gets into when they create a fictional character, and then the, also the very dangerous territory we get into when we represent something um, maybe as it is, but then it gets used in exactly the opposite way to endorse the thing that we would ourselves mm -hmm. maybe condemn or have problems with. So it was a really, it's a really fascinating essay. Yeah, it's it's really, I mean, I, it, it's an incredible one. And I, I mean, even more so, it was really nice for uh, someone to talk about female self-destruction from a more outsider viewpoint in dealing with it um, in the book. You know, it's not her specific self-destruction, but it's her experience of it, and that that was really nice. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. I'm your host, Will Hall, and we are speaking with Sabrina Chapajev, who is the editor of the new Seven Stories Press anthology, Live Through This, on creativity and self-destruction. In Annie Sprinkle and Elizabeth Stevens' piece, that's a piece on how uh, they both used art to deal with... Um, Annie's battle with breast cancer. Uh, that was a very uh, a piece I was very happy to include. Uh, much more positive kind of piece. Much more celebration kind of atmosphere. Much more celebration. Much more. Well, I mean, and, and that's the hard thing is that it, it looks like a complete like celebration of life, but it, and it was, but it was still a very difficult piece. Describe to us what it is that they that they did. Um, Annie Sprinkle is, um, so she's a performance artist and she, her lover and uh, partner 
Elizabeth Stevens is this incredible installation art artist, really, really great. And uh, they decided to embark on uh, a performance sort of venture that Linda Montano pioneered, which is living every single day of your life as art for seven years. And they had each year be the color of a different chakra. And they were into their first year of living every single day as art when Annie was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so sort of in the spirit of the project, but also in the spirit of creation. Annie was really excited. She's like, well, it was great that I had breast cancer because it fits in with all the rest of my work <laughs> because her, her work is very much focused on the body. And um, so they documented... Uh, everything. They documented the surgery. Every single time they went to chemotherapy, they dressed up as a different duo, like a cowboy and Indian, like a pimp and a hoe, you know, just it really made the experience um, into an art project, which really helped them deal with the actuality of what was happening. Um, and I, when I was talking about sort of you know, Nicole Blackman for a second about how she didn't exactly, it's not her personal piece of self-destruction. This was really nice to have a couple going through self-destruction. You know, it was very hard for Elizabeth to watch Annie going through these things. And at the same time, Elizabeth had another best friend that was dying of cancer. So the relationship between people that are going through self-destruction and people that aren't is also something that isn't highlighted often, how painful it is to see someone that you love dealing with these things and seeing how their, you know, their love and their sort of communal art making help them both deal with it. Uh, I thought was very inspirational and just incredible. It's such a, it's such a striking image, the way that they turned something that, you know, cancer, cancer treatment, chemotherapy, something that's just so painful and it's just really, Pushed, pushed into the shadows and it's not something that we look at that they just turned it into this opportunity for performance art and people don't know Annie Sprinkle is, has um, been a pioneer in radical sexuality uh, she's a feminist porn star who really just turned the tables on the porn industry and has really kind of challenged the relationship to the body and sexuality and brought in um, ritual and spirituality and, and art into um, erotica and this experience that she had um, around cancer is really remarkable um, to read. I mean, the, the piece, the book is, is any one of these um, essays is just must reading. It's absolutely such a, a great anthology. And again, congratulations on um, putting this together. It's called Live Through This on Creativity and Self-Destruction. Seven Stories Press. Um, ask for it in your local independent uh, bookstore. Sabrina, tell us, um, tell us about some of the other, um, some of the other contributors. Sure. Well, I think I should maybe turn to the visual aspect of uh, the book as well. Uh, I was talking to a few publishers about publishing this book, and one publisher was really into it, but only wanted it to be written essays. And that absolutely maddened me because uh, I write, but I don't necessarily understand by writing. I like understand things, uh, words, as I do pictures sometimes, and I know that's the same for other people. And I really wanted to include visuals as a part of it. So um, we have some wonderful um, pictures and photos. We have Nan Golden. Is, um, she's a really famous photographer, sort of known for documenting the, um, the sort of self-destruction within her friends and her community. Uh, and, you know, uh, getting her was half luck and half, you know, in ridiculous persistence, but... Once we finally did, it was about four photos that, four or five photos that I chose that I wanted to be a part of it. The photos in the were only one of her, and no, there, I think there were maybe two of her, and then two of the scene that she was documenting. And she was like, I'd actually just prefer to do ones that are of myself. And I was like, oh, I'm sort of bummed about that because, you know, the other photos that I chose were so beautiful. But then Amy Shoulder, who works at Seven Stories, goes, wow, what an opportunity. I don't know if there's been a collection of self-portraits of Nan Golden beforehand. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I've been, you know, handed this incredible gift. So I started uh, researching all of her self-portraits and then found a series of uh, four portraits, uh, each spanning about four years apart from each other. And it's very, very interesting to see an artist at different stages of her life taking self-portraits. And uh, so those are in the book. 
um, another one I found through the Icarus website. I did not know fly before, and I was searching for art, and I was researching like crazy. I came upon your art gallery, and I saw two self-portraits by Fly, and I'd never heard of Fly before. I didn't know who she was. Um, I didn't know that she's this incredible, you know, punk artist documenting the Lower East Side. She's just brilliant. And uh, I emailed her and asked her if she would be a part of this. And uh, what ended up happening was I went over to her place, and I went through all of her journals. She just let me sit there and go through all of her visual journals, and I took probably 120 photos that day. And hers sort of ended up being a piece called Sketching Sanity, Total Disaster Sketching Sanity, and all about how the constant act of journaling and sketching has helped her maintain her sanity during very <laughs> difficult times. And um, so her entire piece is both pictures from her journal that she drew and talking a bit about the artistic process um, as an artist and just a, a really wonderful essay that touches upon a few different things that I don't think have been said before, which is probably my one of my favorite things that she talked about was how she talked about having a really good, um, just you have to be very careful of the environment that you set up for yourself as an artist. It has to be a safe and responsible environment. Um, and she has this one uh, paragraph that says, probably one of the most important things I've learned is that if you're being super creative and everything's super great for you, well, that's great for you. But how is that affecting other people in your life? If you start really looking at that, then that's going to start affecting you too. So you have to start thinking about how you're going to balance, find balance in your life not just for you personally, but for people that are surrounding you. They're part of your environment, and you want your environment to be healthy, supportive, and inspiring, so you really have to take a look at a bigger picture. And I think that's something that is easily forget, uh, is easy to forget when you're dealing with, you know, being manic or, and, and, you know, in the wallows of depression, is your environment not, not just for yourself, but the people that are in your life and how that sort of affects your mental stability as well. Yeah, I really like that essay. Um, Fly is somebody, I guess, is diagnosed with bipolar or something, and she uh, you know, goes through really extreme states. And in, in addition to talking about the, her creative process and her, her art journaling, um, she talks about just some basic wellness things that um, I think anybody who's you know, struggling with those states themselves will get a lot out of reading that essay talking about um, you know, the environment, uh, things like sleep and food and things. And, um, yeah, it's really great. And then also her, her drawings are just, so, are just so, uh, creative and interesting. Um, there's also, there's another, um, there's another graphic artist, um, uh, Diane DeMassa, who I really liked because it starts out with, uh, a therapy session around anger management <laughs> and talks about the kind of the origins of her, notorious um, dyke uh, vigilante character, Hothead Paisan. Tell us about that um, that piece. Absolutely. Well, Diana Massa, besides just being hot, is an incredible uh, cartoonist. And just, I mean, she's just so great. And I approached her specifically asking, I, I sort of reach, researched her and realized that Hothead Paisan was, um, sort of evolved from when she was in therapy after being, uh, you know, uh, a drug addict for about 10 years and uh, she'd had all this rage inside of her and you know her therapist was like why don't you put that in a journal and she was like why don't you? you know so she started taking all of her anger out on you know a piece of paper just blah, you know just drawing this the angriest thing she could and then she kept on drawing that and you know magically other people saw it and were resonating with it being like wait a second I'm that angry as well and she was like, oh, you know, really? Well, I'm just going to keep on drawing. And I think I, I want to bring in one thing that, because I do lectures and workshops around um, this book. And um, one thing that I think that you're not really going to find specifically talked about in the book is the external influence of politics. And there's this one frame of Diane DeMassa, who is like, um, you know, her, her character in this little graphic in this little cartoon that she's made, which she's holding a gun at the TV, and she's just, you know, freaking out of it. And um, 
there there's like a little you know word bubble coming from the television that's like today a man killed his wife for gardening too loud and then he raped her <laughs> and she just has this gun at the tv and uh you know from the outside room someone's like what are you watching and she's like the news and you can just tell the anger and rage like sometimes you do want to shoot the tv you know th- that anger is justifiable if we really listen to what's going on in our country sometimes the rage is so just palpable and un unharnessable you know it's just if you really consciously look at the world you're going to go crazy you know because there's so many things wrong with it that it can be overwhelming and um carol queen in her essay talks about when she was you know growing up in this very small town she was the only one and that was really willing or interested in talking about vietnam and just the injustice and the terrible, you know, what this country had been doing then. And there is this sense of, you know, am I going crazy? I'm the only one that seems to want to affect change to this. And if people in your immediate immediate vicinity are not equally as angered, um, which some people aren't, then you begin to question yourself. And then that rage can spiral into something that is actually self-destructive to yourself, until you start realizing that your rage is justifiable. And um, and that can help you. And once you have a forum or a community of people to discuss this with, then, you know, some of that, I don't want to say some of that rage is calmed, but it's justified. And then you're like, oh, okay, I'm not crazy. This is really wrong. Yeah, that's a very strong thread through the, through the book is the radical politics and people who have anti-authoritarian and feminist um, perspective and I'm very very much involved in different kinds of of activism and I I think that um, one of the things that's interesting about the Carol Queen piece that you mentioned is it it really talks about her origins as a radical sex educator she's someone who's dedicated her life to really getting sexuality out of the shadows and and educating people and teaching people and letting us um, really claim our sexualities and our sexual power and she writes very intimately about her first um, sexual experience losing her virginity and how it was just really awful and she wasn't connected with her body and didn't really have any pleasure from it and just completely had no idea what she was getting into and then that moment of um of of inspiration that led to her entire life's work of trying to turn around coming from this place of of just ignorance and and suppression of sexuality and not talking about it and not knowing anything as a teenager turning around and saying, I'm going to change the world and try and make this a world where we speak openly about this and we educate children and we learn about it so people don't have to have these unconscious, unhappy experiences the first time that they sleep with someone. You know, Carol was, when I asked her about it, she's like, I'm going to write about the time that I wanted to kill myself, you know, when I was younger after this one sexual experience. And as her essay came in, I realized that, you know, here we had Carol Queen talking about when she lost her virginity. That's an amazing story in itself. You know, but a really interesting thing is, wow, why did her, her, you know, losing her virginity, why was that such a traumatic experience for her? Like when I lost my virginity, it wasn't as loaded. And uh, for her, because it was the one thing she put so much investment into like sex and just being like, she's like, this is the last thing. If this, if sex is not awesome, then I don't know what's going to be. And since it wasn't great, you know, that sort of, she was like, oh my God, maybe I, maybe I should kill myself. In fact, I I might even, you know, be pregnant or I might have a, an STD and just that, that maelstrom of not knowing, you know, put her over the edge. And, but that was the interesting thing is that a lot of times the very things that affect people the most and like the most heart wrenching things, can often, once passed, might have the key to what their life is about. I don't know if that makes sense or not. But, I mean, Carol didn't know when she was going through this, or years later, or even until we started doing the essay. She was like, oh, wow, yeah, that's right. Um, that, was, that wasn't when she decided, I'm going to write about sex and study this. She only realized that later on, like, oh, wow, no wonder I was so depressed over that because that meant a lot to me. I didn't know that at the time. The instigating event that 
would would sort of kill some, you know, kill a woman's spirit, uh, oftentimes had uh, a lot to do with um, eventually what would be her success. It's a really interesting observation. I think it, it really rings true for a lot of people, but it's also it's also a very tricky thing to talk about because we don't want to say that trauma or violence are good because of what someone makes out of it. I mean, it's it, it's not the the terrible event or the negative event. It's what someone does with it that they can turn it around and turn it into this something that's powerful and and positive for them. And and then also I think the um. You know, the the story that um, Nicole Blackman wrote speaks to this about how you have to be careful about viewing violence or self-destructive um, events or tendencies as having that creative side, because then it might be interpreted as a message to people, especially um, uh, young people who are reading the book and just trying to figure all this out themselves, that they should go seek out destructive lifestyle or seek out violence or, or trauma because that's going to somehow be their their proving grounds. And I think a lot of young men end up buying into this. And I think, unfortunately, that's one of the things that drives war is the idea that, okay, if I go to war, I'm going to become a man. I'm going to have these formative experiences that are going to test my mettle and are going to prove to me who I really am. And you just... These events, these things that form us, they have to come to us. We can't really go out looking for them because then it just ends up being, you know, flirting with self-destruction. Yeah. No, I mean, that's absolutely true. That was sort of like a worry of mine is that, you know, here I was putting forth these stories of these really intelligent women telling of really terrible times. And I don't want people to look at that and be like, well, I, I need to go through a similar type of thing. So let me sort of copycat that and see if I can, um, you know, maybe, maybe if, if I have the same history as Bell Hooks did or as Inga Musio did, you know, then I'll be really famous or great or brilliant. And it's just, you know, that's not the case. It, it, it is more about looking at your life and what you've been giving, given and trying to understand your own personal voice or strength within it. I mean, it's hard to say, but you don't have to go searching out for self-destructive things. The world will bring them to you. And whatever your personal experience is or whatever your personal trial is, if it's internal or if it's external, if you've dealt with, you know, having to raise, uh, you know, you have two handicapped brothers, and that's a very, very difficult thing, you know, your entire life. Well, right about that, it, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to be something so bloody and painful. The everyday world is, is pretty difficult enough. Yeah, we need as many just strong people just, you know, <laughs> fighting the good fight instead of taking away from themselves so they feel that they can fight better. Yeah, I really liked what you said at the beginning of the interview about how there are plenty of artists who have not had as harrowing and extreme self-destructive experiences as the artists in this book and who are who go on to be incredibly brilliant um, at what they do and incredibly uh, accomplished in their um, excellence. And I think the other thing needs to be said as well. There are plenty of people out there who have very self-destructive experiences, have just been through horrible experiences and violence and have um, have just not been able to turn that into any kind of art that's worth um, worth talking about. It can right. be very sensational and there can be a sort of a poser kind of attitude around it and it can be kind of a, of a trend really. Um, and I think, yeah. I think that's one of the dangers that sometimes countercultural art ends up celebrating that just because it's sensational, it becomes a sensational thing. And we're all, we're such a, a society of consumers and we want to be entertained. And so, you know, the more extreme the entertainment, the more um, excitement we get out of it. So it's really good to hear you right. say that. And I think that's one of the things that's really great about that this is a book, that it's not like, a, you know, a, uh, something that's, that's on TV or something. It really gives each artist the opportunity to present their story with all the depth and complexity that um, really goes into these experiences. It's a really rich book, and I, I really just um, enjoyed it and got a lot out of it, and I really encourage people to uh, check it out. It's called Live Through This on Creativity and Self-Destruction. Um, Sabrina, I, I, we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted you to just um, talk a little bit about one of my favorite essays <laughs> in the book, which is um, my friend and coworker, Bonfire Madigan Shive. Um, yes. She is a, a punk rock uh, cellist, and just gives an incredible account of the origins of her relationship with the cello. So tell us a little bit about that piece. So Bonfire Madigan, uh, it, it, it took a little, 
I, I wanted a musician in the book very much, and that's a very hard thing to get in the book because you can get you know a novelist in the book because it's their form, or even an artist because you can print that. But how are you able to talk about music in a way um, that is sort of palpable and understandable? And uh, Bonfire Madigan is was the perfect person to have in this book because she has such a wonderful history of um, mental health activism, but also just really stellar. Uh, is a stellar musician. So um, I talked to her a little bit. Hers is also an interview. And um, I basically, you know, I she lent me her journal that I got to go through. We we're trying to find some visuals to put in the book because I definitely wanted to have music notation down on there because I feel, felt like very much, and, and Madigan was for it too, just sort of showing music notation was going to ring out true to the musicians in some way. But um, I interviewed Madigan, and we, you know, cut a lot and reshaped it. And uh, I was sort of like, well, what, what do you want to talk about exactly? Or what do you want the focus of this to be? And it was definitely all about finding a new language for mental health and, you know, exploring new ways of seeing mental health as, you know, mad gifts instead of something that, you know, is shamed, which is, also a theme of the book is just sort of being like, hey, don't be ashamed. Don't don't feel terrible about what's happening to you. Just name it in a way that isn't taking it away from you because a lot of the medical establishment seems to put shame on diagnosis. And, uh, you know, I, I interviewed uh, Madigan uh, along with a lot of different people that they're up on YouTube uh, clips uh, about their experience. And even though I knew it, I said... Madigan, when were you diagnosed as mentally ill? And she sort of was like, ah, Sabrina was never diagnosed as mentally ill. I did start realizing my experiences with, you know, intense emotional, um, you know, periods of my life around this time. But that was, it's a constant distinction of how she sees her experience, which is, Instead of having someone else say, oh, you are mentally ill, that is a bad thing, she's like, wait a second, this is happening to me, this is my experience, how can I assess that and re- reform that and shape it into a tool that aids my life instead of constantly takes away from it? It's such an important, it's such an important point because um, you know, c- finding your own language to identify yourself is really, really important to all the artists of finding their own voice and you know just the um the labeling and the pathology of i'm sick and i'm disordered can itself be self-destructive once you internalize that uh, madigan's essay has a incredible uh, photograph reproduction of a couple of pages from her journal which is her wellness crisis plan and uh, this is just such a wonderful thing um to take a look at all the different tools that she uses when she starts to go down and it's really an example of the kind of work that freedom center and the icarus project are trying to do to help us get control over our lives and learn how to manage and and navigate our our state so that we can really tap into the creativity that's in them. Sabrina, we are um, about out of time. Can you give us some um, uh, tell us the the name of the book again, and then um, give us some um, some contact information of how people can find out more about it on the web or, or the YouTube clips with the interviews that you mentioned. Sure. Also, getting in, in touch with you. Sure, of course. Um, so the book is called Live Through This on Creativity and Self-Destruction. It's uh, out on Seven Stories Press right now, so you can go to any big chain, but you should definitely go to your indie small bookstores um, if there's one in your town. Blue Stockings is my favorite in New York. I have a page uh, on the book that links to a lot of interviews and reviews and um, a blog that I have also sort of running where I'm posting different little artistic tips and things like that. And uh, the webpage is sabrinachap.com slash LPT. Um, it's sort of like my personal website with a page for the book. So even if you go to sabrinachap.com, you'll see the, the face of the book and you just press on that and you will be on the book page. And from there, you can go to all the YouTube uh there, there's some great interviews that I have. I have like 10 different interviews with Inga Musio, with Christy Road, um, Silas Howard talking about their uh, specific contribution. I have uh, a panel that we did on sex, art, 
and gender in self-destruction that's up there. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a MySpace for the book. So myspace.com slash live through this 2008. So be our MySpace friend. And when there's readings and workshops, I will post on that. And then if you contact me specifically, uh, just live through this 2008 at yahoo.com. And uh, that's it. I mean, just read it, pass it along to your friends. And, you know, I, I hope that uh, people reading this uh, really just take something from it and continue to live uh, an incredible life. So pick it up. And if you don't pick it up, pick up a pen and just start writing. Sabrina Chapajev, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. You've been listening to an interview with Sabrina Chapajev. She is the editor of the new Seven Stories Press book, Live Through This on Creativity and Self-Destruction. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilof, and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by peer-run mental health communities, freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio to help us get broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net.